Gengar gang, what is going on? My name is Ryan, this is the Analytic Gengar, and welcome to another video. In today's video, friends, we talk about three things you can do to be a better seller here in the Pokemon TCG hobby. This video, in case anyone's curious, is a direct follow-up to last week's video, and is part of a Back to Basics series where basically we'll be taking a look at a variety of things you should know as you enter the Pokemon card hobby. Obviously, my videos aren't just geared towards beginners, so the idea is that even if you're advanced or you're a seasoned seller, hopefully something I say here today is going to be new, informative, or at least provide a little bit of value to you. And if that's the case, I encourage you to leave a like on the video and subscribe and join the Gengar gang as always. But without further ado, let's get into three things you can do to be a better seller in the Pokemon TCG hobby. The first thing is going to be taking good pictures and being descriptive about your listings. Now, listings is a tricky word, obviously, because one immediately tends to think of eBay. And that's fine. A lot of stuff happens and sells on eBay. And so your listing, quote unquote, can definitely be something that speaks directly to that. However, uh, conversations that you might have in your DMs, uh, postings on Facebook, um, offer up Mercari, wherever it is, the idea is that you definitely want to do two things whenever you put something up for sale. The first is get good images of the item. This can vary depending on what it is you're photographing. Now, as a gold standard, I recommend getting a light box and a DSLR camera. However, this can be quite a bit expensive. So let's just pretend you're a rudimentary regular seller um, or just a regular person who, you know, just happens to have a card they want to sell. A couple of thoughts. One, get a dark background. You guys know that playmat that I use in most of my opening videos? If you flip that thing over, it's actually a rubberized surface, and that's actually incredibly safe for trading cards, as long as it's kept clean. Something like that is a great place to start because all you'll need is a phone with a camera, which practically everyone has nowadays, and that black rubberized background. That black background is great for taking photos because it really shows any whitening that might be on the back of the card. And when it comes to the front of the card, you're going to want to make sure that you take photos of the card at an angle with the flash on. The reason you do it with an angle is so that the flash doesn't directly glare in the image. And since you're doing it at an angle, you can highlight many of the imperfections as well as the true beauty of the card. Obviously, you want to make sure your photos are in focus, and you also want to make sure that you're catching all of the important areas of the card. Typically, it's good practice to take one photo at a pretty high zoomed out angle, but capturing the entire card. And then you might want to also take one of each of the individual corners as well, both on the front and on the back. If you do this correctly, you should have five photos on the front and five photos of the back. And this way your seller will be totally, your buyer rather, will be totally informed about how the card looks. You can also take this same type of methodology and apply it to anything else you might be selling. So whether it be tins, blisters, booster boxes, or other sealed product, the idea remains the same. You want good, clean photos of all of the different sides, especially if something is plastic wrapped or saran wrapped or damaged in any way, shape or form. And you definitely want to take photos with decent lighting or flash where appropriate and at a slight angle so that the flash doesn't glare into the photo, but rather really helps to kind of spread light across the entire surface and highlight any imperfections. Again, all of this is really good practice because it's a great way to ensure that as you're selling stuff, the buyer has all of the necessary information about imperfections. I frequently have had it happen where I miss something on a card, but someone calls it out because I take such good quality photos that they're able to scrutinize and see things that I perhaps missed because I wasn't looking as hard. That's very frequent to happen. A seller is just trying to post something online, but the buyer is the person who's going to scrutinize the images and really find the weird quirky things that are, um, you know to be scrutinized on a particular item. The same is true about your descriptions. So this is kind of plays in equal parts. 
writing is a skill that needs to be developed. Um, not all of us are good at writing, not all of us are bad at writing, but it is something that you can get better at with time. So the idea is really simple. Um, take a look at the listings of very successful sellers on eBay. You can see the folks that are top rated and learn to mimic their writing style if you don't have any idea of how to write a good description for an item. Um, just some couple random high level things. Whenever you're selling anything, I advise describing it as mint because mint implies that it's in perfect condition. And I promise you it's probably not in mint condition, especially if it is something vintage. Another good practice, especially for graded cards, is to never assign a grade to a ungraded card. So if you have a raw first edition base set Charizard, don't call it a PSA 6. Um, I've seen that done on places like Facebook or even places like uh, eBay. And I think it is done for search engine optimization. Basically, people put that in the title so that it shows up in more results. But the problem with that is that a buyer could then technically hold you to that as well. And it might sound absurd, but you never know what someone might try to scam you out of. And the worst part of all is that they can point to your poorly written listing and say, oh, look, this person advertised that as a PSA 6. It got a PSA 3. I demand a full refund. Um, and you know, you want to avoid situations like that. So by being descriptive, using good photography and really kind of developing your craft, you can really take really solid photographs and use your words to describe the item and give the buyer all necessary and pertinent information for them to make an a formed decision based off of. Item number two is knowing your costs. So this is an important one um, that a lot of sellers, especially new sellers, are very quick to miss out on. So knowing your costs depends really on the platform you're selling on. If you're selling on Instagram privately, obviously there's no cost, quote unquote, associated with selling on that platform. eBay, on the other hand, has a fee schedule. And then there are other um, sites like Mercari or Facebook that have varying rates depending on what it is you try to do or if you're buying advertisements. The main goal of knowing your costs is about managing your own bottom line. The last thing you want to do is end up in a situation where you have sold something at a loss, not because the final price was at a loss, but rather because after fees, taxes, and the platform fee, they've taken away so much money from you that you basically lost money during this transaction. That's not a good selling practice. I promise you that's a very quick way to go out of business and perhaps even get discouraged from engaging with the community, which is definitely not something that you want to do. The other major component here is knowing the costs tangential to your sale. Here's a good example um, of something that genuinely happened to me. I've been in situations where I've bought raw card lots from people. So, you know, vintage EX era stuff. Actually, all the PSA graded returns that we've had on the channel recently, like the big 300 card lot submission, that was a similar type of purchase where I just bought a crap ton of old cards and got them graded. Uh, one of the issues that I encountered along the way is that the seller didn't realize that it was going to cost quite a bit of money to ship those cards to me overnight and also that they didn't realize that protecting the cards while shipping was going to be so expensive. Reason for that being, in addition to the cost of the cards that they had, they also then had to factor in the cost of penny sleeves for 300 cards, as well as top loaders for 300 cards. They then had to get ETB boxes, which fortunately they had lying around the house. But then once all of that was packaged, taped up and bubble wrapped, it became really heavy. And since it didn't fit in a priority mailbox, it ended up having to be another box that was purchased, taped up, wrapped and shipped using priority mail. Long story short, the original sale looked really good, but what was funny was that after all of those costs were factored in, all of that stuff started chipping away at their profit. And it actually got to the point where it became a little awkward because if you didn't have the money to kind of, you know, purchase this stuff, it ended up delaying your sellers, uh, your purchasers 
delivery. So long story short, if you didn't have the money to buy all the stuff to protect the cards, you couldn't ship the cards. And obviously as a result of that, you had to delay shipment, which again is a great recipe if you wanna be known as a terrible seller in the community. So long story short, you should probably be building all of these costs into your price. Case in point, if you go on eBay, and you look at anything for any of the major sellers, you'll notice it's usually at least 10% to 20% greater than that if you hit them up. So, you know, go find a listing and then hit them up privately on Instagram and you'll notice they're very quickly able to lower the price by a pretty significant margin. The reason for this is because eBay takes a pretty hefty 10 to 15% fee depending on the scenario. And as a result of that, it can basically be impossible for them to make a profit if they don't charge a stupid amount more than market value. Um, same concept applies when you're selling things, you know, just in general, make sure that you're adding in a certain percentage, whether it be for overnight shipping, for insurance, for priority mail, because the last thing you want to do is end up in a situation where you have to go to your buyer and say, Hey man, can you bump me $40 for top loaders? Cause that's really just not professional at all and should be avoided at all costs. Finally, but not least, number three on the list is don't skimp on protection and shipping. This is the most important part of a seller's job. I cannot explain this enough. Um, and this is for both your protection as well as the buyer's protection. So hear me out. When you're shipping, um, a lot of people think the seller's job is done, but it's actually not. The seller doesn't really finish their job until tracking says delivered and someone messages you and says, hey, package or receive, everything is well and safe. Until that happens, it's just not a thing. Like you're not off the hook just as of yet. At least that's the way that I approach it. And frankly, I think that's the way every seller should approach selling. Because realistically, our job's not done until that card's in your hand and you basically relieve us as a seller of any liability or any kind of issue that may arise with the card or during shipment. So the idea is you've just sold your card, right? Congrats. What do you do now? Well, the first thing you should do is immediately document the state of the card. A timestamp is really useful here and a very quick way of doing this is either by grabbing a bulk card or even a penny sleeve and writing your name, the date, the time, and the name of the buyer on the penny sleeve or the card. You can usually do this in Sharpie marker. Then if you're using a penny sleeve, put a card in it obviously, otherwise you can just show the card. Take photos of the front and the back of the card or the item that you're shipping. Then if you can, record the packaging of the card. The best way to do this is to buy a cheap phone stand or a tripod. Again, you don't have to do it professionally. It's for your protection. But if you're packaging something on your kitchen counter, for example, get the sugar jar, put it in a position where it can basically show most of, what, of what's happening, put your phone on record, and just test to make sure you have a good angle. Once you have a good angle, leave it on record and go ahead and package the item. Again, show the timestamp, package up the item. Here is a good opportunity to also make sure you're not skimping on protection for the item. So here's your opportunity to bubble wrap your items really, really well. I've mentioned this before, but you want to use that type of tape that's terrible by hand and not the type of shipping tape that you see on the outsides of boxes. This type of tape can only be torn if cut with a razor blade or a sharp object, and it's not safe to use that type of tape on a delicate vintage Pokemon card, a PSA slab, a booster box. Heavens forbid someone's hand slips and accidentally cuts through the plastic or scores the card or cuts through the cardboard, it's going to be really awkward. And I'm not saying all buyers would do this, but some buyers may be willing to you know, try to scam you at that point and say, hey, I didn't do this, you did this and you sent me a defective product. Again, you wanna avoid the possibility of that happening. It's not to say anybody in this community or in general would do it, but all I'm saying is it's happened before and if you can avoid it, why not? Then what you wanna do is now that you've bubble wrapped it securely, you're using the proper type of tape to secure this thing in place, make sure to pad the rest of your box as well, right? The box is an important aspect of the shipping. You wanna make sure that you're using a good quality box 
and good quality tape. Now, you've got some bubble wrap around this thing, you've put it in the box, you've continued to bubble wrap and pad the inside of the box. Now it's time to tape this thing up. Let's go ahead and use the proper transparent type of tape that resembles more of a plastic. Let's go ahead and tape this thing up repeatedly several times over. This is an excellent time to basically tape the thing so much it's practically waterproof. Let's go ahead and print your shipping label, paste it onto the box, and let's go ahead and tape over the return address as well as the to address. This is to ensure that even if the package gets scraped and dragged across the floor and rained on and someone throws mud on it, the to and the from address will always be visible and theoretically will always be protected from the elements. You might also want to do that for the tracking number. Finally, but not least, and bear in mind, all of this was on video if you listen to me about setting your phone up, but you can also just photograph this entire process along the way as well. Finally, you want to go ahead and take images of the outside of the box as well. Now, in case you're curious why I'm telling you to photograph every step of this process, one part is about protecting yourself as a seller. You want to make sure that people see how you package your item as well as what condition your item was in when it was packaged up. The other reason is that if your mail is ever lost or damaged or something happens and it ends up with the USPS's lost mail receptacle, you want to have images that show what the box looked like before it was damaged. Oftentimes what happens is if mail is damaged during shipment, they grab it and they immediately throw it in a bin, tag it and put it off to the side. When you get in touch regarding lost mail, someone is going to take the images of what was in the box and go looking through those bins. They're going to go one by one and try to match what you're sending them in terms of images with what came out of the box when it was damaged. So if there's a booster box in there and you can show them, oh hey, this vivid voltage booster box was in there, well then, now all of a sudden, they might be able to more quickly identify it, meaning your mail will be found quicker. And finally, but not least, um, it's also good to just have this process documented in general so that you can send it off to your customer so your customer also knows that you're taking extra precautionary steps to very clearly document and evidence how this stuff is being sent. Now you might think I'm crazy to suggest all of this for, you know, let's just say a Battle Styles booster box or a Vivid Voltage booster box. Honestly, I kind of agree. I've had this stuff shipped to me in bubble mailers before. so. Realistically, it's totally fine if more modern day product is perhaps, you know, skimped on when it comes to this kind of stuff. It's all a matter of how much protection is needed based on how much value is there. I will say if someone sent me my whole on Phantoms box in a bubble mailer, I would send it back to them with not a very nice comment. Enough said. The idea is, re is relatively simple. You want to make sure that, you know, depending on what your client wants, you're meeting and exceeding their needs when it comes to the way things are shipped. Now, all that said, some other random quick tips. Instead of bubble wrap, you can use newspaper and you can use plastic bags and you can use paper bags. So there's tons of different ways to kind of skirt around the idea of bubble wrap. Honestly, it's more environmentally friendly to use something like a recyclable paper filler material. And I've noticed places like Amazon and online stores are shipping with that more and more instead of using air filled bubble wrap or bubble padding. Another thing um, is that Amazon and other online retailers are a great way to have an excellent variety of boxes and shipping material delivered to your house. I for one am a big Amazon user and so I always have boxes coming in but it's actually really helpful because then I don't have to go out of my way to buy a box. I can recycle a box and I can recycle some of the shipping material in order to go ahead and save some costs on my own end. Also, because it, I got it for free, I'm usually tempted to use a lot more of it, which again is never a bad thing because at the end of the day, it means my client's stuff is going to get there safe, secured, and in far better shape than before. Um, and with that said, friends, thanks again for checking out another video. As I always say, I appreciate you spending some time with me, and I hope today a lot of the sellers out there in the, in the community really got some additional value from the comments that I've made and the sort of points that I've chosen to highlight. Of course, the general theme across buyers and sellers is be professional, but hopefully some of the more specific points 
kind of struck a nerve or struck a chord. And hopefully that's something that gives you all as a seller some value here in the community. As always, I appreciate your viewership. I always say you could have been anywhere on the internet, but you chose to spend some time with me, and that's always much appreciated. If you found today's content valuable, feel free to leave a like on the video. And hey, you can also hit that subscribe button on your way out to join the Gengar gang. Hope you guys are having an amazing day. PSA Greater returns this Saturday, so uh, that'll be a nice way to shift things up a little bit. And other than that, thanks as always, and we'll talk soon. Peace. Thank mm -hmm. you.